Harajuku, Tokyo, Japan. This Shibuya neighborhood has pervaded pop culture not only domestically, but internationally in the last 30 years, becoming synonymous with quirky fashion, insane street style, and all things color and kawaii. Incredibly influential fashion mags like Fruits and Kera, and pop stars like Gwen Stefani and Kyari Pamu Pamu helped spread the Harajuku name and style across the world. But what exactly is Harajuku fashion? How did it begin? What makes it unique? Can it even be defined? How is the term shaped by popular perception? Stick around the rest of the video as I attempt to explore these questions and perhaps provide some answers. But before we jump in, let's see if some of the people on the streets of Harajuku could give any insight to these questions. ま、自分を表現できるものだと思います。なんかいろんなジャンル、ストリート、ラグジュアリーとか、ヒップホップもそうだし、あとYTKとか、なんかそういうのも混じり混ざって表現できるものだと思います。例えば、なんかま、渋
a free spirit and precise attention to detail. The concepts of free spirit and extreme detail that first helped Tokyo fashion rise in the 70s and 80s can still be applied to the fashion of today, particularly in the street fashion of Harajuku. What makes Harajuku stand out is often its diverse and unique fashion subcultures, but what exactly causes these to arise? And how is it any different from the rest of Japanese fashion? Kawamura Yunia writes in Fashioning Japanese Subcultures that subculturalization is the result of urbanism. The concentration in urban areas of large heterogeneous groups of people weakens interpersonal ties, primary social structures, and normative standards. Dynamic population density leads to a complex structural differentiation with consequences of alienation, social disorganization, deviant behavior, and inami. Some well-known examples of Harajuku subcultures are Dekora and Lolita, both of which have further subcultures of their own. Both were first documented in the late 90s, with Lolita appearing in Harajuku in opposition to Shibuya subcultures, with members originally congregating on a small bridge near Harajuku Station. Dekora was originally documented by Shuichi Aoki in the street fashion magazine Fruits in the late 1990s through the early 2000s. The street fashion of Harajuku was only able to take root thanks to the hokoten of the 90s and early 2000s, pedestrian roads which were home to informal weekly meetups between members of different subcultures, as well as the famous Harajuku fashion walks documented by Tokyo Fashion. It's worth noting that Kawamura and many other scholars of fashion history largely credit the creation and perpetuation of street fashion subcultures to high school girls, really emphasizing the power of the youth and setting it apart from high fashion. According to Kawamura, this is called the trickle-up or bubble-up method of distribution. She explains that, if a subculture does happen to emerge in a small district like Koenji, popular stores will relocate to Shibuya and Harajuku. Thus, subcultures are becoming less geographically specific. New subcultures do not grow or expand commercially unless there are institutional supports to respond to consumer demands. Unlike high fashion, which places a lot of emphasis on semi-annual fashion shows, subcultural fashion labels do not require fashion shows to spread. However, they still need mega stores to sell clothing and fashion items that project a certain image of a particular group. PhD student Yana Katzenberg explained in her research that Harajuku fashion is a product of the blending of the exoticization of foreign cultures and the internationalization that came with continuous contact and business with other countries and peoples. Much of the Western influence that is seen in Harajuku fashion can be explained by the time of American occupation, when Harajuku was a gathering spot for Zoku. These people were drawn to Harajuku in the 1950s by the cool Western atmosphere bestowed on the area by foreign services and shops catering to American residents. The internationalization of the area expanded even further with the Tokyo Olympics in 1964, as Harajuku and its adjacent areas were the main stage of the events and even housed the competing athletes. American influence has continued to pervade the subcultures in Harajuku, with a lot of American college-type clothes seen in vintage stores and a clear element of American hip-hop culture. Western media had somewhat of an obsession with Harajuku fashion within the past decade or so, oftentimes simply due to the outrageous and unconventional outfits that couldn't be found anywhere in the West. Harajuku became the symbolic stand-in for Japanese fashion worldwide. Gwen Stefani's debut album Love Angel Music Baby featured songs such as Harajuku Girls, and promotions included an entourage of Japanese-American girls who Stefani named after her album. Katzenberg says that this definitely brought the district further into the public eye. However, the public did not only react positively, but also criticized Stefani's open exoticization of Japanese street fashion. She's swallowed a subversive youth culture in Japan and barfed up another image of submissive, giggling Asian women. Most of these articles and videos focused on the Decora fashion subculture, likely because it is just so wildly different. But in doing so, it has shifted common perception of Harajuku fashion to become synonymous with Decora, and to a similar extent Lolita. But in a way, this is exactly what Japan wanted. As Harajuku fashion spread across the world, the government used the momentum to their advantage. In 2009, the government appointed three Kauai ambassadors as part of the Cool Japan campaign. Even though Harajuku trends had moved on and the neon-colored looks of the 1990s had become niche by then. For one one year, the ambassadors were to act as trend communicators of Japanese pop culture in the field of fashion, advertising the fashion styles they represented abroad. This export of Japanese fashion in this way is something which Shoichi Aoki called an anachronistic disparity between the perception and reality of Harajuku street fashion. In the 2010s, the creator of the popular Harajuku fashion label 6% Doki Doki, Sebastian Masuda, used the momentum of Harajuku's popularity to his advantage. In 2011 and 2012, he was the art director for Kyari Pamu Pamu. Katzenberg says that through these successes, as well as numerous convention visits, he realized the potential this colorful signature look could have for the rapidly growing tourism market. Together with event restaurant operator Diamond Dining, he opened Kawaii Monster Cafe in 2015 on Meiji Dori, a colorful fantasy world in which the iconic Harajuku girls, called 
Monster Girls, put on a show in their street fashion-inspired costumes. A prime example of the self-exoticization of Japanese fashion at the time. Media representations such as Stefani's increased global awareness of Harajuku, but at the same time causes the exoticized, abbreviated, distorted image of crazy Japanese fashion, with Harajuku as a synecdoche for it, to persist in the minds of foreign visitors. Beyond this narrow, exoticizing perception of Harajuku as a mecca of neon color styles, the creatives working there are now increasingly perceived worldwide, so internationalization on a professional level seems to be continuing. Related to the perceptions and realities of Harajuku street fashion, recently the weird girl aesthetic has taken over TikTok and runway fashion, defined by the use of bright colors, weird patterns and shapes, and a general sense of maximalism. Seems familiar, right? I did notice that a lot of these articles failed to mention Harajuku's influence on the new weird girl slash maximalism trend, only referring to different runway shows and also the Hadid sisters because I guess they're apparently some like pioneers of this new trend, but it's not really new, is it? In a way, it feels like a massive appropriation of the subcultures born from small-time creatives and schoolgirls in the streets of Tokyo, without crediting any of that influence. Though I suppose that's kind of how fashion works. It is cyclical in a way, so I guess I can't really call this appropriation, but I think that it does really stray away from the classic Harajuku aesthetic and repurposes it to the top-down fashion cycle, which I guess would not be considered Harajuku at all. So the Marc Jacobs and Unifs of the world can bask in their popularity from the weird girl aesthetic, but the real Harajuku creatives will find a way to subvert and perhaps birth something new that will change what one thinks of when they hear the words Harajuku fashion. So what exactly can we conclude from all of this information? In my opinion, all we can say is that what visually defines Harajuku fashion is always changing, and it is subjective to each person's opinion and what they are exposed to in relation to Harajuku fashion. But I think that behind the scenes, the essence of Harajuku remains the same. Despite all the change in recent years, with the rise of fast fashion, the loss of many small businesses, commodification and tourist commercialization, the trendsetters and rebels will continue creating. Even if the physical Harajuku location changes, they will always carry that essence with them wherever they may be. And with the recently announced return of Fruits Magazine, it proves that there are still cool people in the streets of Harajuku, so perhaps we will be entering another golden era of street fashion in the near future. But for now, that concludes my very brief look into the history and culture of Harajuku street fashion. All of my sources will be in the description below, so I highly recommend checking them out if you find yourself interested in diving into Harajuku fashion even more.